In the U.S., the 1990s was a time of constant spectacle that can be observed to loosely track the consumptive habits of the nation's populace. The popular culture of this particular time and place reflects a sense of both wonder and yet a looming disenchantment. U.S. politics in the 90s was in a state of fluctuation precipitated by a major shift to the right in the 1980s. In response to this shift, a new character emerged in the Democratic Party. He came from a faction of centrists, the so-called New Democrats. In practice, Bill Clinton operated as a sort of managerial bureaucrat in service of capital, and the unceremonial continuation of neoliberal policies by the Clinton administration coincided with a time of seeming economic prosperity. But underneath the surface of this bustling society, the untold suffering of those living in the margins is evident if one only bothers to look. And apparently, if we're to take this here title screen at face value, the 90s was also a time in which a certain mysterious PlayStation game was created. It's a game that's truly like no other, unsettling, enigmatic, and apparently unfinished. Or perhaps it would be more appropriate to say it's a growing organism. But of course, the main reason it's a game like no other is because it's not playable. Not by any one of us, at least. I mean, let's drop the charade. What we're talking about here is a fictional video game used in service of a narrative. It's a tale so confounding that the only people foolhardy enough to take on the task of interpreting it thus far have been basement-dwelling chuds. I'm kidding. Of course, if you've paid even one iota of attention to this whole pet scop phenomenon, you know that a whole online community has formed in a completely organic fashion in order to figure this thing out. These communities have produced myriad observations, theories, interpretations, and speculations. Many of them are compelling and really quite convincing. And if you've been watching my investigation series, you also know that I have a certain take on the work myself. And as with Petscop the game, I dare say my interpretation is, for better or worse, a growing organism. Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. This is part six of my Petscop investigation series. At this point, I don't think I really even need to say this, but obviously, if you have not watched the material yourself, please do so prior to watching my videos. And if you haven't seen the previous videos in my investigation series, that would be the logical starting point for my videos. If you like the other stuff I cover, I promise you, it's worth it. As per usual, just keep in mind that Petscop can go to some uncomfortable and horrific places, so keep that in mind, and if you're not in the right mindset for that, it's perfectly alright to sit this one out. Again, I would like to give a shout out to the Petscop subreddit, as well as the contributors to the Comprehensive Progress document. Links to both of these sources will be in the video description. Okay, so I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping before jumping into it. Primarily, I just want to take this chance to promote my channel, since these videos tend to attract a bit more attention than average. So, if you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash nightmare masterclass. And just a nice little incentive here, if you donate nine bucks or more, that's three coffees in Ko-Fi terms, within the next couple of weeks, I will give you a shout out in an upcoming video. If that's the case, leave a comment with your donation specifying how you'd like to be credited. And of course, if you can't afford the expense right now, that's totally understandable. There are other ways to help me out as well. First and foremost, you can share my videos with others who might be interested in this topic. And of course, you can subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. Click this little bell if you want YouTube to inform you when I upload a new video, if they're so inclined that is. I've been told they're not terribly reliable about that, so keep an eye out for new videos on your end as well if you really want to stay in the loop. Alright, that's enough shameless self-promotion, let's get on with it already. In terms of general updates with the Petscop YouTube channel, I should mention that a note was posted in the About section on June 27th, 2018. Update for 627. Paul is okay. 
His work is bearing fruit, and there will be a public compilation video of his, quote, attempts. He appreciates that people care about him so much. Now, the question of what exactly Paul is attempting here is addressed in Pet Scott 14, which was released later in July. We'll talk about that soon enough. In October of 2018, the profile image for the Petscop YouTube channel was changed yet again. This occurred a day before the release of the 16th video, which dropped on Halloween. The icon now appears to be a darkened portion of the game, namely, it appears to be a screenshot of an image that appears in Petscop 16. As far as the significance of this specific image goes, I'll hold off on that for now, and we'll talk about it in the section for that video. But I should note that fans have generally interpreted this sort of change, a shift from an image of Paul's avatar to some other darkened image, to mean that the channel is now inactive and won't be uploading another video in the immediate future. The last time this happened, the icon changed from a screenshot of Paul's avatar to a portion of the New Maker plane, specifically the tunnel from which blue and red cars come rushing out. And that appeared to correlate with a period of inactivity for the channel. And recently, the About section of the channel changed yet again. It is looking a lot sparser this time around. Whereas previously, this section contained a lengthy explanation about Paul and his um, tumultuous relationship with these figures I've previously referred to as the proprietors, now the section simply reads, Recordings of a Video Game. Hmm. Let's proceed. So if you're unfamiliar with the typical format for this series, let me fill you in on the details. I'm going to be combing through the latest three installments of Petscop and making various observations as I go. When you hear this noise, it means that I'm pausing to talk about something particularly noteworthy. Now, let me just explain a little bit about why I've been doing this. In my video about Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, I stressed the value of what I called a close reading, basically a shot-by-shot -shot analysis of the material. That is essentially what I've attempted to do with the format of my investigation series. And you know, I'd say that if there is any recent work that demands this sort of concentrated attention, it's a detail-laden series like Petscop. Towards the end of this video, I will try and formulate some general thoughts about what's happening with the overall narrative arc of this series. And I'll also discuss some of the general themes I've observed. As always, if you think what I'm saying is highly off base, or if you just have some thoughts to add to the conversation, please do so in the comments. And on that note, I have received a ton of insightful and extremely thought-provoking comments on my Petscop investigation series over the past year or so. And I've been toying with the idea of doing a comment response video for this installment. So, like I said, if you have some thoughts or reflections to offer at this point, please do so. I always look forward to hearing people's take on Petscop, and it really does say something about the interpretive process that this work produces such a numerous and diverse array of theories. Okay, let's dive into this new material. Petscop 14 was released on July 17, 2018. It is 27 minutes long. The video begins with a bright green screen. The demo sign is flashing at the top. And then Paul's avatar walks into a bedroom. Notably, the bright green color of the screen previously shown to us has been retained at the bottom of the screen in the background, as well as in the doorway. If I had to guess, I'd say this is a children's room, possibly for siblings. As you can see, there are two twin-sized beds in here. First, the character takes a gander at what appears to be a series of cards on the table to the far left. Then, Paul's avatar walks up to the table on the far right-hand side of the room. There's a small windmill on it. It appears to be modeled after the windmill previously seen in the new Maker plane. The screen displays a message. This windmill vanished off the face of the earth. A soothing jingle begins to play. The screen reads, Here's a similar puzzle. For you, Marvin. Footnote. Let's just call attention to the way in which this message is phrased. It says, for you. Does that sound familiar? We've previously seen the phrase for you in the very first video released on the Petscop YouTube channel. Paul found the game with a note that said, for you. I previously speculated that the person referred to as Rainer throughout Petscop might actually be the person who designed the game itself. Additionally, I speculated that he made it for a specific person, Marvin. And now, we are given access to a portion of the game in which a puzzle is addressed directly to Marvin. That very detail would seem to be consistent with this speculation. 
The idea of someone leaving a puzzle for someone else to solve is a motif that repeats throughout the work. And in a certain sense, we can construe the work itself to be an instance of this, i.e. a puzzle left for us to solve. Though I wouldn't necessarily take that observation at face value. I don't quite view Petscop, the series, as a puzzle to be solved. In fact, I think it's something of a pitfall to view it that way. More on that later. Let's proceed. The screen reads, there are two pictures of a door. In the first picture, the door is closed. In the second picture, taken later, the door is open. A bass drum plays steadily in the background. Nobody opened the door. The door did not open itself. The door, in fact, did not open at all. What happened? As the player exits the prompt, the music shifts to a more playful sort of melody, the likes of which you might hear played on an organ. Paul's avatar then begins walking up against the bed to the right side of the room, first against its right side and then against the foot of the bed. He does this for a prolonged period of time, around 30 seconds. The music shifts back to that same soothing jingle that was playing when Paul approached the windmill on the table. The screen then abruptly cuts to black. We find Paul back in the house first seen in video 11. Paul states that he's suddenly been inspired by an idea. However, the manner in which he says this is possibly sardonic. He relays that the idea is similar to the one that brought him to this very house. Paul's exact words are as follows. Um, thankfully I have been uh, suddenly inspired by an idea that is, in a way, similar to the idea that brought me to this house. Um, because that idea involved pretending. Pretending something was there that wasn't there. And this idea involves pretending that this door right here, this one, is open rather than closed. You can see that it's closed. Um, but what I'm going to do and what I invite you to do as well is picture, I'm going to picture in my head that this door is actually open right now. Um, and if I were to pass through this doorway, um, what would happen? I would, would I bump into a door? No, because the door is open, right? I would just keep going into the room that's there. And I happen to know I'm going to walk into the room right now. Uh, da -da -da. I'm in the room. I happen to know what this room looks like because I saw it in a demo recording just today. Um, and you can see it too. I assume it will be up on the family YouTube along with this video that I'm recording right now. At this point, it is required of Paul to manipulate the controller as though he's able to go through this here door and walk into the bedroom. Footnote. Okay, there's a lot going on here, so let's break it down. Recall that in video 11, Paul relayed that he'd been given some indication about how to access the house in the new maker plane. Previously, there was a scene in which Paul made oddly elaborate movements in the middle of an empty field. This generated a big wheel that pointed him in the direction of the house. And now Paul is relaying another instance in which he seems to have oddly specific details about how to advance. Is someone instructing him on how to progress further in the game? Maybe, just maybe, the game itself is providing the instruction in a roundabout sort of way. The mechanism by which Paul is able to progress is heavily reliant on demo sequences. In order to move forward in the game, Paul has to pretend the game is in a certain state. Specifically in this case, he has to pretend that this here door is open. Confusingly, as Paul explains this dynamic, the screen fades into a different session in which the door is open. Paul's words would seem to indicate that he doesn't perceive the door to be open, but we can clearly see that in this particular session, it is. So what the hell is going on? Well, note that the screen indicates a demo sequence is currently playing. I believe what has happened here is that the game footage has been edited in such a way so as to make Paul's words match up with the part of the game that he's talking about. To be clear, I don't think Paul sees an open door. He sees a closed door. The demo sequence is something that plays later after Paul's initial session, and that footage has been placed over Paul's voiceover as he explains this dynamic. Marvin's actions in a previous video appear to precipitate this very dynamic. In video 8, Marvin suddenly came out of the tunnel and later proceeded to walk directly into a wall. His actions at this point were elaborate. Later in this very same video, Paul speaks with someone on the phone who apparently claims that a pathway used to exist in this very spot. With that in mind, it's not a stretch to say that Marvin was operating as though the pathway was still there. Just like Paul has to now walk into a door and continue playing as though the door is open. 
And, you know, it's a bit confusing, but just from a formal standpoint, the way in which this was done in the work is quite possibly the most economical way to demonstrate this dynamic. Let's continue. As Paul is explaining his plan of action, the screen shifts back to the main room of the house with Paul's avatar still in the corner. It's clear that Paul's not able to see how his movements are extrapolated in the bedroom, though he is able to deduce a few things. Paul figures that he could be on either side of the bedroom, depending on whether or not he's been blocked by one of the beds. It turns out that yes, he has been blocked by the bed on the left side of the room. The screen fades back to the bedroom, presumably in order to make it clear what is happening. Though it is important to note that Paul is apparently still not able to see what's going on. This has been edited to make the viewer's experience more coherent. Footnote. Sorry to interrupt again, but there's a small problem here. The dissonance that we experience when Paul indicates that the door is closed despite the fact that we can clearly see that it's open is repeated in the 14th video just a minute or so later. Except this time, the dissonance pertains to a serious discrepancy in Paul's accounting of events. Paul explains that we should see a windmill on the right side of the room. In its place, we see a censored box. We can discern that the demo sequence we're shown at the very beginning of the video is, in fact, the demo sequence Paul is referring to. See, here's the windmill right here. This later sequence in which Paul is explaining his strategy depicts a version of the bedroom that Paul has evidently not seen, at least not at the time of this particular recording. It has been retroactively edited to go along with Paul's narration. Back to the video. Paul approaches the table on the left side of the room. Again, he's apparently not able to see what he's doing here. It's a lot of guesswork on his part. Paul assumes that he's prompted a text box, since that's what previously happened with the windmill. But in this case, we the viewers can see that he's actually been presented with a number of different images, all of the same item. It's a framed photo of some kind of disc. We are presented with a total of 15 iterations of this item, each image from a different perspective. The bottom left hand image is highlighted. This one is a front facing view of the disc. Paul operates under the assumption that he needs to skip through a bunch of lines of text, so he presses X continually. The bottom left hand box is selected, and it moves to the center of the screen. An ominous bit of music plays as the image is displayed. Paul speculates that perhaps he hasn't been presented with a text box and with some exasperation proclaims it could be anything else in the world. Paul presses buttons randomly just to see if anything happens. We the viewers can see that he's just switching back and forth between the display of the various discs, occasionally selecting an image. When he does so, that same ominous bit of music plays. In a sarcastic tone, Paul says that he thinks he's being productive. He continues pressing random buttons, again, occasionally selecting an image of the disc. The screen fades to Paul's avatar in the bathroom of the house. This is presumably what Paul is seeing as he presses random buttons. We can loosely correlate the controller sounds with the avatar's erratic movements. Paul can be heard reprimanding his cat. After this, he starts singing a little tune to pass the time. And notably, at the very end of this sequence, Paul mutters something under his breath. Why don't we take a listen? I'm playing this game too fucking much. Paul then starts banging his controller in frustration. Shortly after this, the scene abruptly cuts. Footnote. It is worth pointing out that Paul's various comments during this scene might be construed as offhanded and humorous in a playful sort of way. He seems to joke about being productive with respect to his progress in the game. On the other hand, there's a sense in which his comments might be construed as exasperated, as though he's increasingly growing tired of figuring out the seemingly endless series of puzzles presented to him in Petscop. Back to the video. The scene cuts to what we can safely presume to be another point in time, though how much time has passed since the previous scene is unknown. Again, Paul is attempting to navigate the bedroom from his vantage point back in the main room of the house. This time, he seems to have the benefit of hindsight. That is to say, he's apparently watched at least some of the demo footage from his previous session. We know this because Paul notes that the windmill on the right side of the room, seen previously in a demo sequence towards the beginning of this video, isn't there. So we can assume that Paul eventually saw the same demo footage that was shown to us as Paul was blindly navigating the bedroom during the previous scene. The same footage in which a censored box appears in place of the windmill. 
Paul explains one of the game's quirks, namely its tendency to show previous sessions in the form of demo sequences. Though Paul is careful to note that there can be important differences between the original sessions and the demo sequences. This game mechanic is what gave Paul the idea that he might be able to go through a door that, in his original game session, was actually closed. Since certain elements could be different in the demo sequence that plays later on, it's plausible that the door in such a sequence could in fact be open. So when Paul walks into the door, his movements will presumably map onto a demo sequence to be shown at some point later, after Paul finishes this particular session. And at that point, Paul will be able to see the fruits of his labor or the lack thereof. One somewhat confounding factor with this game mechanic is that these demo sequences can occur a considerable amount of time after the original session. Paul notes that he's seen a number of demo sequences, the original sessions of which were a year ago. In addition, Paul speculates that some demo sequences are scripted. He relays one instance in which he lost the footage from a couple of subsequent sessions. Presumably, he's using some kind of software to record the gameplay on his end. In this case, he had the sound, but not the footage itself. However, Paul says that he later witnessed the game itself playing these very sessions in the form of two demo sequences. Footnote. At this point, it is safe to say that Petscop, the game, is somehow recording Paul's movements as he progresses through it. As to the particular instance Paul is referring to here, we can possibly infer that he's talking about certain demo sequences that played during previous videos, since Paul does note that this footage was up on the public YouTube. That phrase, public YouTube, is telling. Is Paul implying that there are videos that aren't publicly available? Is there a separate channel that's entirely private? There are a number of open questions at this point. Paul goes through the images and selects each one of them. He demonstrates how the player can change the angle of the picture frame. Each time he selects an image, that same ominous music plays. However, when he selects the center image, which initially shows the picture frame facing away from us, the game plays a slightly higher pitched version of that ominous music, so as to call attention to this center square. Paul moves on and he speculates that he very well could have gone off the rails at this point. There is presumably no way of knowing on his end what he was able to accomplish until he sees a demo sequence that emulates his exact movements. The scene cuts to black and we get a shot of Paul back in the main room of the house. Paul establishes that this is attempt six. This time he's going to try and push a bucket through the door. Paul aligns the bucket with the door and starts doing his thing. At this point, Paul states that he's just going to leave the bucket in the room and see what happens. The scene cuts to black yet again. In the next scene, Paul is right in the same space, the main room of the house. Astonishingly, Paul states that this is his 22nd attempt. Paul leaves the bucket at the side of the bed on the left side of the room and meticulously works his way around the perimeter, towards the right hand side of the room. This time, instead of some kind of dissolve effect, we get a clear shot of the demo sequence. Paul walks towards the censored box in the upper right hand corner and the bucket inexplicably appears next to him. When Paul goes near the bucket, a paint roller appears. Paul engages the paint roller and begins painting over the wall, right in the exact place where the sensor box is. Paul paints over the entirety of the box and it disappears, presumably because the contents of the box have been obscured by the paint so as to make the box unnecessary. Paul leaves the bedroom and says, all right, now we're in the scary part. It's unclear exactly what he's referring to, but it's possible he just means that this is a particularly difficult part of the game. He navigates his way through the main room and turns around the corner towards the upper right hand portion of the house. The screen cuts to black and we hear a heavenly series of voices singing a single note in unison, so as to create a sort of droning sensation. The screen is entirely black except for the flashing demo sign. After a few seconds, the music stops and the screen goes entirely black. The Garolina logo appears just like when the game normally starts, but this time it's presented at an angle. The title screen appears. The boiler on the bottom reads, copyright 1997 by Garolina as per usual. Footnote. What do we make of the Garolina logo presented at an angle here? Well, let's consider my previous comments on the logo itself. Basically, the etymology of the word Garolina, along with the shape of the logo, seems to connote the phrase hook, line, and sinker. This phrase is commonly used to refer to someone that has been swindled or compromised in a manner akin to a fish that's been caught by a fisherman. 
Okay, so we've established that there's a fishy theme happening with the company name and logo. But what about the manner in which the logo is tilted here? A user recently pointed out something interesting in a comment on one of my videos. Considering that the logo is now slanted, perhaps this is an indication that this fisherman is getting a nibble. Maybe someone has taken the bait, so to speak? Paul goes to load his game, but there's a little problem. Where his original save file once appeared, it now reads, Strange Situation. Footnote. At this point, I'd be remiss not to point out that the term strange situation can be construed as a reference to a certain procedure created in the 70s by a developmental psychologist named Mary Ainsworth. The purpose of this procedure is to observe so-called attachment relationships between caregivers and young children. It is conducted on children between the ages of 9 and 18 months old, essentially toddlers. The procedure is carried out over the course of 21 minutes. During this time, the caregiver and the child are placed in an unfamiliar playroom, and then the child is subject to a number of repeated scenarios in which the caregiver leaves the room and a stranger enters. This is said to emulate the comings and goings of both familiar and unfamiliar people in the child's everyday life. Researchers observe the child's behavior, and an assessment is formulated based on certain criteria. In extremely broad terms, there are two groups, secure and insecure. Simply put, secure children display confidence that their caregiver is available and able to meet their needs. Conversely, insecure children display a lack of confidence in this regard. At this point, it would be fair to say that Petscop, the series, displays an overt concern with matters of child psychology. I'm certain no one has forgotten the work's allusion to the story of Candace Newmaker, who was notably diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder. Now we have a reference to a procedure, the purpose of which is to assess attachment relationships between caregivers and their children. Back to the video. The other two files are empty. Paul becomes concerned that his original save file has been deleted. He switches back and forth between the files in confusion, and after a moment of hesitation, Paul selects the first save file, the one labeled Strange Situation. The game loads and Paul ends up in the front yard of the house, but things are a little different today. There are a few signs in front of the house. The sign to the far right has an arrow pointing towards the house. The sign next to it has a cake on it, and a yellow balloon is tied to it as well. We can see a sign that has a picture of the character known as Care. Note that Care is depicted here in her initial state, what the game refers to as Care A. Additionally, there are a number of arrows on the ground leading up to the front door. Paul explores a bit, observing that whenever he moves away from the house on either side, the screen gradually turns completely dark. There's nowhere else to go. So he moves down the road and into the house. The loading screen is that familiar image of a chair in front of a piano, seen previously in the 11th video. Paul enters the house. Let's take a look around the front room and see what we can find. There's a yellow balloon near the front door, right where Paul just came in. And there's a dark purple balloon tied down directly across the room near the end table with a single piece of cake on it. Under the plate, there are what look to be various drawings. They appear to be renderings of the infamous tool. Additionally, there are a number of presents below the table with the cake on it. There are three presents immediately visible. One of them has a green ribbon, one has a yellow ribbon, and one has a purple ribbon. Footnote. Let's also note the symbols scrolling across the screen in the background. This is not something we've seen previously in this area of the game. The symbol corresponds to the one that scrolls across the screen back in Randis and Wavy's room in Evencare. This version appears to be a negative inverse of the version shown in Evencare. Back to the video. A line of dialogue is presented to us. The speaker is unknown at this point, but the text appears to be the same color as one of the balloons. You made it. Happy birthday. Why are you covering your face? Oh. In a frustrated tone, Paul says, what's that supposed to mean? At this point, it becomes clear that Paul's avatar is carrying around a yellow balloon. He walks up to the birthday cake and a little icon with a question mark appears, prompting Paul to interact with the item. A dialogue box reads, of course I recognize you. Those eyes, that nose, that's still you. Footnote. I should point out that the so-called child library system employs the use of certain facial characteristics, namely eyes, eyebrows, and noses, as identifiers for certain characters in the game. For example, Michael Hammond, Care, and perhaps even Paul himself. 
This line of dialogue, those eyes, that nose, that's still you, appears to connect this game mechanic to a deeper, you might even say thematic statement. You are who you are despite changes, perhaps even changes that are a result of trauma. The work alludes to certain facial characteristics remaining constant, but I would say this is essentially a metaphor. Despite certain changes, some things remain constant. You still retain your identity despite these changes. But if you recall certain comments pertaining to an injured dog and later care herself, it would seem that the designer of this game feels differently. In addition, one of the tool's responses in an earlier video is called to mind here. Here we see an instance in which a character appears to be returning home after some time away. Speaking of changes, there's an awkward moment at the beginning of this exchange when the speaker asks Paul, who seems to be a stand-in for Care, why she's covering her face. This is perhaps due to some major change that Care is uncomfortable with presenting at the moment. We can only speculate about the reasons why some of Care's facial characteristics have changed. Of course, at an earlier point in the story, we're told that her eyebrows aren't growing in, to which Marvin tellingly responds, that's a puzzle. I do think the work is prompting us to start making these connections. Back to the video. Paul walks up to the single piece of cake and inspects it. A dialogue box reads, go ahead and have a slice. Oh, don't worry about those. Footnote, this line is possibly referring to the drawings under the cake, the various renderings of the so-called tool. It might well be reasonable to worry at this point, considering that the tool has previously been referred to as something that can be used as a weapon. Recall the lines, Marvin picks up tool, hurts me when PlayStation on. Let's proceed. Paul walks away from the cake towards the far right. There are two calendars on the wall. The one on the left is green and the one on the right is red. Paul takes a look at the green calendar. It's November. The first 10 days of the month are highlighted in green. And there's a little birthday cake on the date of November 12th. It's a Wednesday. Every day after the 12th is blacked out. Paul looks back to October. The entire month is highlighted in green. Footnote, recall that in the 11th video, there was a sign in front of the house that said, this is a frozen house captured three times exactly as it was. In that same video, Paul happened upon a green calendar in this very location. This here calendar in video 14 appears to be the same one from that previous video. But we can discern that the so-called strange situation depicted in this video, Petscop 14, takes place at another point in time. It's one of the three points in which this so-called frozen house was captured. Here's what I think is going on. In Petscop 11, Paul happened upon the house and the events depicted in that video occur at two different points in time. June 5th, 1997, and then Christmas that same year. June 5th being the date of Care's disappearance. Petscop 14 depicts the events of November 12th, Care's birthday and her apparent return to the house. Back to the video. Paul's calendar viewing experience is interrupted by another line of dialogue. I sure hope you've realized by now. It doesn't matter how long you've been gone. It doesn't matter how much you've changed. You aren't lost. Stop wandering and come home. Footnote. If we take these lines of dialogue at face value, what appears to be happening is quite clear. Some maternal figure is desperately trying to reconnect with her child. Paul takes a look at the red calendar. Again, there's a cake on November 12th, but this time, the 12th is a Sunday. As with the previous calendar, every day after the 12th is blacked out. Paul takes a look at prior months and finds nothing particularly notable. The entire month of December is blacked out. Paul says, let me check something, and we can hear some noises as though he is perhaps rummaging through some items. The screen cuts as though some time has passed, and then Paul speculates that this red calendar represents either 1995 or 2017. He pauses for a moment to contemplate this. Paul then mutters something under his breath. Getting that bad feeling again. Paul goes into the bedroom. The room darkens as he enters it. Care, are you okay? You ran straight into the door. Did you think it was open? Aw, oh, poor baby. Footnote, of course, the idea of running into a door is something of a trope used in various forms of media to signify some type of physical abuse. It's just the sort of thinly veiled excuse an abusive parent or perhaps the enabling spouse of an abusive parent might give for why their child has a bruise on their face. And I think it is safe to say that this reading is not entirely unfounded, considering that one of the major themes, if not the major theme of Petscop, is the abuse of children. This would seem to imbue a dark connotation on the riddle previously shared with us towards the beginning of video 14. 
Paul explores the area. Strangely, he seems to be able to move behind the beds, as well as the tables pressed against the back wall. A light tracks the avatar as Paul moves around. Again, Paul walks up to the table to the left and interacts with the items on it. Previously, we saw that the player could interact with a number of discs. This time, we cannot see the contents. But that same ominous sound effect plays as Paul peruses through the items. A bit of yellow text comes up. The sound effect that plays as the text appears is noticeably lower in tone than usual. Where is the disc? Where are the discovery pages? Paul says, wait a second. Ominous music plays in the background. What are you talking about? What disc? Discovery pages? Jill, stop fucking ignoring me. Get in here and show me where that disc is. Jill. At this point, Paul sounds distressed and confused. No care, this is mommy. This is your mommy. Sweetie, I'm right here in front of you. There's no one else here. What are you looking at? What's over there? Care, can't you hear me? Can't you see me waving? Snap out of it. Care, where are you going? We then get a sudden cut to black and shortly thereafter we see Paul in the exact same spot he was before. It's unclear how much time has passed. Paul explains that he thinks this portion of the game is based on a conversation he had last year on his birthday. He then speculates that someone is pulling a prank on him, although he's not able to figure out how that's possible. Footnote. So, if the green calendar pertains to various events related to the disappearance and reappearance of this character known as Care, what does the red calendar pertain to? Paul is indeed correct that the calendar possibly refers to either 1995 or 2017. If we take into consideration that the game is possibly referencing a conversation Paul had last year on his birthday, mind you this video was uploaded in 2018, it makes sense that the red calendar itself refers to the year 2017. So the red calendar is most likely one that specifically refers to events in Paul's life. Is November 12th Paul's birthday? We don't have confirmation of that, but if it's true that his birthday is November 12th, it would certainly be a strange coincidence, considering that also seems to be the date of Care's birth. Paul goes to exit the bedroom and the game freezes. Paul exclaims that he has to call Jill, confirming that this is indeed a person that A, exists outside of the game, and B, is acquainted with Paul in some way. The screen then cuts to the save files. Again, this strange situation file is the only one that isn't empty. Paul is uneasy, but nonetheless, he continues. He winds up back in the house during the same event, the birthday party previously depicted. Paul explains that he's done a bit of research online, and after receiving a bit of ridicule at the patent absurdity of his question, he has confirmed that one cannot write over a CDR, the type of disc that Petscop is presumably written to. Paul's just trying to figure out if it's possible that, hypothetically speaking, someone got a hold of his game and created a new version with his personal conversation inserted in there to, you know, freak him out. Based on the fact that one cannot write over this type of disc, that would appear to be impossible. Indeed, this is proving to be a strange situation. Paul walks into the door to the right. A loading screen depicts a darkened scene from Randis and Wavy's room back in Evencare. Paul enters a room he refers to as the garage. He happens upon a computer. A series of pages appear on the screen and Paul notes, this is the website. He happens upon another page and speculates that it's something called the Your Child page, based on the amount of text that appears on the screen. Footnote. Recall that the note Paul found with the game prompted the reader to visit a certain website. We the viewers aren't privy to the name of the website nor its contents, but it does seem as though Paul knows a bit more about it than we do. After all, he seems to recognize a specific page, one he refers to as the quote, Your Child page. Strangely though, it seems as though Paul hasn't been able to access the site either, as he bemoans the fact that he's unable to read the text here. Paul peruses through these pages, and then we're presented with an image of Paul's avatar in the new maker plane directly on the computer screen. Paul looks around the garage and then heads to the bedroom. The screen darkens, and before he even enters the room, a large black box appears. It almost encompasses the entire lower half of the screen. Paul says, fuck. And then the video abruptly ends. Footnote. At this point, I'm not exactly sure Paul is proceeding on his own accord. I've previously speculated at various points that Paul is being coerced 
meaning he is being threatened or pressured in some way. But there's no direct evidence to support this, at least not as far as I can tell. We do have some indication that Paul, quote, had issues with some arrangement with the proprietors. The possibility that he is under duress seems increasingly likely to me as more videos in the series have been released. There is also the possibility that some supernatural element is at play. And if we take Paul's first-hand experience of the game at face value, this is a possibility that is becoming increasingly difficult to discount, especially if we consider the events of this particular video. That wraps it up for Petscop 14. The 15th video was uploaded on July 18th, 2018. It is 6 minutes and 16 seconds long. The video starts with what appears to be a demo sequence. The player is shown making their way through the school. The green tool appears to be available for use as per usual. The player wanders through the hallway, collecting pieces as they progress through the game. However, the player repeatedly gets sent back to, uh, this thing on the wall here. So we've previously seen this figure in Petscop 11. It was shown to us during a loading screen. The player walks through a passageway in the wall and ends up back in the classroom with Marvin. The player enters a sequence of buttons and the words not in table appear above their head. Marvin responds, sit here for the present. Footnote. Paul has previously speculated that some demo sequences are scripted. I don't think it's too big of a stretch to say that that's what we might be seeing right now in video 15, a scripted demo sequence meant for the player to view. Although that's not entirely confirmed. This could very well be a demo sequence based on another player's experience sometime in the past. Paul has previously noted that the demo sequences can sometimes appear a good amount of time after the original session has occurred. In Paul's case, it was about a year. But is the game holding on to sessions from before Paul's time? A jingle plays as the player sits in the desk right in front of the chalkboard. Nothing happens for a few seconds. At 2 minutes and 52 seconds, the game glitches out and for a split second, a sliver of the avatar is copied in the space immediately to the right of where the player is sitting. Eventually, Marvin comes out from behind the left side of the chalkboard and another character comes out from behind the right side. It's the character previously seen in Quitter's Room, the one that mirrored Paul's movements. Marvin says, this is Bell. The E from the end of the name as shown previously is missing. Footnote, this way of spelling Bell would appear to be consistent with Marvin's peculiar way of spelling Paul's name. In video 11, Marvin spells his name P-A-L-L, -L, as opposed to the correct spelling P-A-U-L. A user called Ephemeral Collation left a comment on one of my videos explaining this peculiarity, and I think their rationale is the most clear and concise way to account for these spelling discrepancies. Basically, the game is referencing a standard dictionary, a huge list of words that doesn't recognize proper nouns, such as names like Marvin, Paul, or Bell. So towards the two minute mark when the player tries to enter Marvin, the game returns not in table. It's an error message that appears because there's no word called Marvin in the dictionary that the game references. There is, however, the word Paul, spelled P-A-L-L, -L, which means a piece of cloth spread over a coffin, hearse, or tomb. And so I presume that Marvin chooses this word to approximate Paul's name. Same goes for the word Bell. Back to the video. This character says, I am Tiara, not Bell. A bell rings as each word appears. The character then says, press nifty. The player responds, what? Attempting to perform the suggested task, the player enters nifty via the game's language system. Tiara responds, no, player one press nifty. There's a long pause, and then suddenly something that seems to be a texture map appears on the screen. Footnote. A texture map is a two-dimensional image that can be applied to the surface of a 3D model. In this case, the map looks to be a surface for the classroom. A cursor appears to be moving across the screen. After a while, the cursor begins drawing a series of small lines on the map. After this, the cursor spells out HI right on the chalkboard. The player exits the texture map and sees that HI is written on the chalkboard in the classroom. Those very same lines appear on the wall as well, like a repeated pattern. At this point, the video ends. 
Footnote. So what can we glean from this enigmatic demo session? A couple of things I would say. For starters, it seems that by entering a certain code on the controller, the player can access a special tool that enables them to manipulate levels by editing their corresponding texture maps. But what actual pragmatic use is there for scribbling some lines on the walls of the classroom? Well, let's also take into consideration that the cursor spelled out high on the chalkboard. If I had to guess, I would say this is a certain mode of communication for two different parties to interact in the game. Now, when I say two different parties, I'm not necessarily saying that the player is literally able to communicate with another person, although that's a possibility. I'm not quite sure how this works in literal terms, but it seems to me like the character who calls herself Tiara is showing the player that she can communicate via this text texture map editing tool. But this is only one mode of communication. There are others. For instance, the player can at various points convey messages using elaborate combinations on the controller. But this specific mode, the map editing feature, enables the user to draw things and perhaps even convey messages that Marvin doesn't have access to. That wraps it up for Petscop 15. The 16th video was uploaded on Halloween, October 31st, 2018. It's only 2 minutes and 40 seconds long. The video starts with what appears to be a static image. It seems to be a darkened room. Footnote. Note that this exact image currently serves as the YouTube channel's icon. It appears to be an image that depicts a certain angle of the garage previously seen in video 14. Suddenly, a message appears. No controller input has been detected for a very long time. Families, neighbors, police, or whoever, keep game console running. Call provided phone number. And then, what looks to be a phone number is censored at the bottom of the screen. Footnote, there is in fact one frame in this video that shows the first three digits of the phone number. This area code 203 has been linked to an area in Southern Connecticut. So what do we make of this? Well. Considering how meticulously crafted this series is as a whole, I would venture to guess that this is not something that was mistakenly left in the video. I mean, if you're going to censor the phone number out, why even include it in the first place? As to what it means in relation to the narrative, I have no idea at this point. It could very well be that the story or a majority of the story actually takes place in this area. Perhaps Paul lives in Connecticut. Perhaps the proprietors who control the Petscop YouTube channel are based in Connecticut. Others have speculated that the game company Garolina was based in Connecticut, but there's not really a whole lot of other evidence to corroborate any of this, at least as far as I can tell. For now, I'll leave it at that. The screen continually flashes red. A large graphic slides over from the right, encompassing the entire screen. It looks like a diagram of a bedroom. At the bottom right hand side of the screen, it says burn in monitor, and then in parentheses, ghost room slash testing room. Footnote. Many have speculated that this flashing screen that changes back and forth between the message and the diagram of the room is a mechanic that keeps the screen from burning out after a long period of inactivity. The idea is essentially it's a screensaver. Of course, this raises a series of questions. Is this Paul's game? And if so, why is he inactive? If not, whose game is it? And why did they stop playing? Back to the video. There's a bed in the upper left-hand corner of the room and a little red dot. The dot is flickering. There's some sort of platform in front of the bed, possibly a chair. And then directly in front of that, there's a television. Note that it's clearly an older TV, not the flat screens that are common today. To the side of the TV, there's a black box that I would assume is the PlayStation console. And then there's some sort of contraption on the right side of the room. Footnote, does that thing look familiar to you? I would speculate that it's the piano we've seen in a previous loading screen. Recall that it is connected to a PlayStation controller. And further recall that keyboards and music have both been key elements in various puzzles and other sequences presented in the game. In a previous video, Marvin roped the player into playing some sort of instrument he referred to as the needles. Based on this, I would speculate that Marvin, the character, is perhaps a music teacher of some sort. Note that Marvin reprimanded the player for not playing to his standards. Now, in that video, some elaborate representation of the music was shown on the chalkboard as the player performed, and the root note was represented by a little house icon. This makes sense considering the root note of a key in music is the point of resolution. 
And of course, I should point out that Paul was previously directed by the tool to help Marvin find his house. So music is strongly associated with Marvin. And now we have a depiction of the piano previously shown to us from the loading screen right here in a diagram. Is this setup real? Has someone actually fashioned a system in which a piano is connected to a PlayStation console? If so, for what purpose was this done? I don't have the answers to these questions, but I do think we can at least begin to speculate in an even-handed way about some possibilities within the fictional universe outside of the game. Back to the video. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a little circle with an arrow pointing upwards. It almost looks like a compass. The red dot slowly moves from the bed to the chair in front of the television. The game shifts between this graphic and the aforementioned message. And well, that's pretty much it for the 16th video. Why does Petscop have the effect that it does? There's an artistic and literary concept I want to talk about here called verisimilitude. This term refers to the manner in which a work is true to life. In other words, when we say that a certain artistic depiction has verisimilitude, what we mean is that it is realistic in relation to the subject of its depiction. That's kind of a clunky way to put it, so let me give an example. For instance, we might say that an actor's performance has verisimilitude, meaning that their performance was believable and seemingly organic. We might say that Petscop has a certain verisimilitudinal quality, but what does that mean in this case? It's not a straightforward question. We're talking about footage of gameplay from, you know, a fictional video game. What does verisimilitude mean when the entire aesthetic experience of a work is not rooted in the natural world, but rather the graphical artifice of a video game, and a fictional one at that? I don't think Petscop the series would have the sort of cult to claim that it does without this unrelenting adherence to an aesthetic so convincingly rooted in video game design. Namely, the imagery and mechanics of a PlayStation game circa 1997, or at the very least, the generation of games from this era. Let's consider the medium of video games in general. In some respect, we might liken the code Paul is required to enter in order to go into the new maker plane to the sorts of commonly used cheat codes in video games. In the same vein, we might also think of Even Care not as the first level of an unfinished game, as is suggested by the game itself, but rather a sort of tutorial that gives the player some sense of the game mechanics. One thing I might also point to in this case is this phenomenon known as speedrunning, and the manner in which glitches in certain games are exploited in order to lower a player's time. For instance, in Mario Kart 64, speedrunners have utilized a certain glitch on Rainbow Road, the final track. If the player intentionally hits themselves with a shell at just the right point in the track, they can fly off the road and wind up right before the finish line, essentially skipping an entire lap. That's just an example. There are many, many other cases in which speedrunners utilize glitches. A lot of these glitches seem similar to me in some respects to the dynamics Paul needs to figure out in order to progress further in the game. Petscop is a game comprised of numerous instances in which so-called glitches are integrated into the gameplay experience such that it's actually required of the player to exploit them in order to progress. I mean, if that's the case, we can't technically call them glitches, can we? They're an essential component of the game, and it can be reasonably inferred that they've been put there deliberately. For instance, the manner in which Paul needs to become the quote-unquote shadow monster man is something that, in any other context, would fairly be considered a glitch, like some kind of error in which the game incorrectly renders the player's sprite. But when Paul becomes the figure known as the shadow monster man, he's able to access the windmill. Speaking of glitches, there are a number of instances in which we can see visual anomalies within the game. For instance, in my very first installment of the Investigation series, I pointed out that the Go Back button appeared to be fluttering, and I speculated that this perhaps was a subliminal warning to Paul, a subtle indication that he should stop playing the game. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that my interpretation was met with a bit of skepticism. Various users commented on my video and gave a technical explanation for the fluttering. Some called it a compression artifact. This explanation always struck me as valid, but incomplete. The technical aspects of a work are certainly worth talking about, but a substantial critical analysis of the work has to go beyond that. 
But I recently had the thought, you know, what if this line of inquiry is itself a theme of the work? I want to call to mind the rationale I previously cited in reference to the conspicuous misspelling of certain words by Marvin. The game references a standard dictionary and does not recognize words outside of that set. Words such as proper nouns. So when Paul enters the name Marvin, he gets that pesky not in table error. Marvin realizes this and uses an approximation of Paul's name, the word Paul, P-A-L-L, -L, in order to communicate with him. Makes sense, right? Okay, so while there is indeed an entirely plausible technical reason for the misspelling, it nonetheless seems obtuse not to point out that the word Paul, P-A-L-L, -L, has a pretty ominous connotation. Namely, it connotes death. That seems important in my view. The question of whether or not certain technical facts can fully explain a given phenomenon seems to be a repeating theme. Recall that Paul has previously speculated that the game is trying to make it seem as though it is inhabited by a so-called entity. Throughout this whole interpretive process, it kind of seems like we the viewers are supposed to be wondering whether or not various anomalies in the game are indeed technical glitches or some foreboding indication that something is terribly, terribly wrong. But of course, the former does not necessarily preclude the latter. In terms of viewing the work as a whole, I would assert that both are true, and that's part of what makes Petscop an effective work of horror. It's an artistic depiction of systemic horror. The dominance of puzzles throughout the game has in various ways shaped the discourse surrounding Petscop. So it makes sense that many seem to view the work as a puzzle to be solved. The various riddles we've seen thus far, a vanishing windmill, a door that is inexplicably open despite not having ever been opened, can perhaps dissuade us from looking at Petscop in this way. These are riddles that, in my view, are not meant to be solved, at least not in logical terms. What is clear is that Paul's gameplay experience is one in which he's challenged to solve a series of logical puzzles that become gradually more and more complex as he progresses through the game. Recall the elaborate sort of pretending that Paul has to carry out in order to keep moving forward in the game. Petscop, the game itself, is making Paul employ an increasingly high degree of abstract reasoning. And this is not inconsistent with the idea that the work itself is one big puzzle that needs to be solved. But as I've indicated earlier, I don't think that's the best way to think about Petscop, the web series. With respect to the game, I don't think there's anything to solve, or at least I don't think anything good will come of this venture. With respect to the work itself, I would say that one cannot view Petscop merely as a puzzle to solve, a series of clever little logical games. One has to consider the broader context, both with respect to the context in which Petscop the series was created, and also with respect to the time and place that Petscop the game is situated in. The gameplay tracks the experience of a child navigating an adult world with seemingly arbitrary rules. It's a world in which horrific events are heavily implied. In a similar vein, I have stated previously that I think Petscop demonstrates how the material conditions of one's environment during childhood inevitably shapes their personality and sets up behavioral patterns that repeat into adulthood. I mean, that's something of a truism, so let's see if I can flesh it out a bit. For starters, I would say that this behavior, which is a result of the conditioning process, ends up reifying the same attitudes that, you know, justified and rationalized these material conditions in the first place. At this point, I might further speculate that Petscop demonstrates how patterns arise as a result of certain ideological beliefs. Values that are presupposed, asserted onto the individual through systemic means, prior to the quote-unquote game having even started. For instance, the notion that collecting pieces is a good thing is, at its core, ideological. There's nothing intrinsically good about collecting pieces, it's simply necessary to have a certain number of them in order to progress in certain parts of the game. But of course, the notion that progress in the game is good is also ideological. I think Petscop can be seen in part as a commentary on this way in which our culture is obsessed with previous decades and the aesthetics associated with these various time periods. Increasingly, it seems as though pop culture is mired in the past. 
cycling through various fads of 70s, 80s, and 90s nostalgia. Our pop culture is continually and pathologically hearkening back to a previous era, a time when things were simpler. Of course, this is at best an oversimplification, and at worst, a complete illusion. Nonetheless, in the process of overly romanticizing the past, a whole new generation becomes entranced in the seductive glimmer of nostalgia, a desperate longing for a time that never really existed in the first place. This is in part because hope for a better future can only really be abstract and somewhat alien at this point. Looking at the current state of things with sober eyes will not produce a hopeful vision of the future. But the entertainment industry as it currently exists constantly needs something to fetishize, to commodify, and to obsess over. So, you know, if the future is not a viable source of this fetishization, you have to look at the past. It is certainly true that Petscop, the work itself, uses the sensibility of 90s PS1 game aesthetics, but it does not do so to elicit nostalgia. Rather, it uses that sense of comfort one might feel at the sight and sound of an old PS1 game from their childhood in order to lure the viewer into a false sense of security, so that later on, when things get weird and, well, unsettling, the effect is all the more powerful. In the scope of my analysis, I really consider nothing to be off the table in terms of potential threads of inquiry. With this in mind, I recently made a certain connection that I believe is worth mentioning here, if only for the sake of perhaps better contextualizing some of the underlying thematic elements of Petscop, which up until now have been seemingly disjointed. In the very first video, directly upon entering the place known as Evencare, Paul happens upon a sign. The sign states that Evencare has closed indefinitely. It used to house over 100 quote-unquote young pets, of which a total of 48 remain. The contents of this sign evoke an economic and political term known as austerity, a set of policies which ostensibly set out to balance the government's budget through both cuts in spending, usually by defunding welfare programs that people rely on to get by, and tax hikes, oftentimes in the form of regressive taxes on working class people. Now, how does this relate to Petscop? In my view, Petscop depicts the horror that occurs underneath the surface of what, by other superficial indications, appears to be a healthy functioning system. If we were to judge the game based solely on the cheery artifice presented to us in the gift plane, we might well construe Petscop as nothing more than an unfinished children's game. Of course, there are signs along the way that subtly imply this is not the case, but it isn't until we experience the horrors in the New Maker plane that this becomes explicit. You know, at various points in time in the last year, the stock market has been at an all-time high, and we might look at that and say, wow, we're doing great. But you know, in the broader context of things, specifically in the last few years, we in the U.S. have been repeatedly subject to the threat of government shutdowns due to various hyper-partisan disputes in Congress, the latest of which stems from disagreement over funding for Trump's proposed border wall. I'd like to offer a modest suggestion. These trends, this gradually escalating sort of turmoil that we see not only in the U.S., but across the world, is not indicative of stable, functioning governments. They're symptoms of a fundamental problem with our global economic system. Let's consider for a moment the cost of this dysfunctional system, namely the human cost. Petscop, the series, seems to implicitly focus on people living in the margins of society, those who are subject to an inscrutable and oftentimes hidden form of institutional violence in a manner that is sadly a trademark of the epoch known as late capitalism. Those folks who, for one reason or another, have found themselves to be forgotten, unmentionable, or perhaps even erased entirely. As I've previously stated, I think Petscop is an artistic meditation on the abuse and mistreatment of children, as well as the long-term consequences of said abuse and mistreatment. The work alludes to one Candace Newmaker, a girl who was failed by a number of people, not the least of which I'd argue would be the bureaucracy of the state itself. Her story is well documented, and much has been made of this illusion. But the sad truth is, we can't possibly know the names or the stories of all the victims who have been lost to time. But we can imagine a better world, a world in which we no longer make excuses for the terror. And we can contemplate and reflect on a work of art that, rather than offering a literal recounting of specific events, 
tells the story of victims in metaphorical and thematic terms and lays bare the social conditions that lead to these problems. I would say that's a public service if there ever was one. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. Again, if you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash Nightmare Masterclass. Thank you for watching and good night.